These three young offenders are before this court for sentencing on a very serious incident of assault. It was a foot stomping resulting in neurological injury. The victim initiated contact with the three defendants and two girls. The latter group was swimming at Cultus Lake when the victim took some of their clothing after insults had occurred. The clothing was discarded. Later that evening, and after some urgings by the girls, the defendants went looking for the victim. He was brutally attacked. He was kicked in the head and body while he was in the ground. His injuries are significant. He has outlined in his victim impact statement the details of a lengthy convalescence. He incurred loss of cognitive abilities, psychological and physiological changes. He has had a very slow and painful recovery. Furthermore, his injuries did not merely impact his own life, but as well that of his parents as they tended for their injured son. There is little redeeming value in saying they did not intend to do the harm that occurred. Well, the day of defense, uh, we were having a good time, picked up some girls on the beach, went out boating, did a little bit of cliff jumping, went uh, drinking and stood oh, we all skinny dipping, having a good time with the girls. A few guys came walking up on the dock, approached us, asked if we had any uh, marijuana to buy. We said no. Nah. Some guy came along, picked up their shirts and stuff, and was like, oh, what do we got here? He us off a bit and decided he was going to take the girls' clothes. And we were like, uh, I don't know, the girls were like, oh, go get her clothes back, go get her clothes back. And then we went swimming over towards the dock, and this guy ran off uh -huh. with them. We confronted him, asked him for his clothes back. He, uh... Got lippy, whatever, we got lippy and got out of hand, they hit him and everyone jumped on him and we all attacked him. It just turned out to be a bad night, beat the kid worse than we thought we would have, tried just knock some sense yeah. into him. After he was down and it was like 30 seconds, everything was done, we all just kind of booked it. We were just, he was laying there not saying nothing, not moving, we were just like, oh fuck. We left buddy's house and they all told us that uh, all three of us are getting uh, charged. Assault. Yeah, it was aggravated assault. Didn't know what that was at the time. A uh, little bit worried, thought I was going to go to jail for uh, a little while. Didn't know what was going to happen. No, when I found out the victim was in the hospital, I didn't expect that I did that much damage to the guy. I was a little bit worried for him. I didn't know what was going to happen to him, what was going to heard he might die from the swelling in his brain. So I was a little bit scared at the time. Lots on my mind at that time. Uh, I was convinced after speaking with you that these were not criminals, but rather kids who were, who did terrible things because they had had too much alcohol and they weren't a whole bunch different from any other, you know, most normal kids. And to put those children in jail is not a solution. Uh, nor would it help my son heal and nor help my family heal. Obviously people's parents care about their children and they were pretty upset. And I remember when I was standing there, his mom was crying and uh, was asking me why we did that. And I just couldn't even look at her, I just had to look down. It wasn't the boys that were bad, it was what they were, um, the drugs and the alcohol that they were on and the peer pressures, that's what I believe caused them to get out of hand that night. When I saw the victim again and his family, it was a little, I don't know, it was hard to deal with, I guess. I looked at him and I could see that he was looking at me and I didn't really recognize him at the time, but I guess I just had a feeling that that was him. And I just had to look away. I didn't, couldn't really look in his face. Well, I received a call at midnight. I'd been trying to page Colin for about an hour and he hadn't answered my pages. And about midnight, I received a call from the Cultus Lake uh, police. And they told me that he'd been badly injured. And uh, so I rushed down and 
uh, when I got there, they were just loading him into the ambulance. He was unconscious and in convulsions and uh, followed him back to the hospital. And Panic. Um, basically, I guess, went into shock and right away phoned my husband, Michael, and um, raced to the hospital. Um, I found a lot of people crowded around my son's room, um, not allowing, no one was allowed to go in the room um, except for myself because Colin was screaming for me, um, mummy, mummy, and uh, when he got conscious. And um, so I went in for a few minutes, but then I was quickly asked to leave because I was ill. I was sick myself, so um, I had to leave the room. And then whatever. pretty hectic in the conference as well. Uh, there's, there's a lot of emotion in there, right? My mom is emotional. She's crying, and my buddy's mom is crying, and my other buddy's grandma is crying. Everything. Like, his parents are crying, and it's just like, oh, just what kind of made you think about why you do something like that? And I didn't know what to think when I walked in there. Right? I didn't know what was going to happen or what to do. But then after seeing them. Him asking me a few questions first. It's a little he easier. really wasn't able to walk unassisted. Um, his speech was heavily slurred. Of course, visually, he, he was frightening. He was purple and you know, badly bruised throughout his body, especially his face and neck. There was actually a footprint on his face from where someone kicked him with a running shoe, and there was a visible footprint uh, on his cheek. Uh, he certainly wasn't coherent in a way where you could carry on a conversation. Um, he could talk some and he could understand what you're saying to a degree, but uh, it took a long time, you know, weeks before we could really carry on an intelligent conversation with him. With that, uh, he was actually uh, more cool with it than uh, his parents were like, he just was like, you know what, he's like, whatever. He's like, don't beat people so bad like that. Like, it you know, screws them up. And he's like, I know I was being lippy and stuff. Probably deserved to get in a fight, but not that bad. And I understood that, and he understood that. So that was nice. I didn't expect that at all. The conference was very tough. It was extremely emotional. Um, definitely a trying time in my life, not understanding what was going through these boys' head, not understanding how something like this could happen. Um, when I left, I was very nervous, of, like everybody, about the conference and, and what was going to go on. It was a highly emotionally charged uh, conference. I think it was probably the sing single most touching time of my life, uh, as far as emotion. Uh, emotion for them, emotion for my children, my family, their families, their mothers, father that came and the grandmother. Um, this had been very hard on all of them. These three youths' willingness to participate in a family conference and the constructive results demonstrates that a community-based sentence is likely the appropriate response. Furthermore, each youth, by their social background, family support, and strength of personal characteristics, appear to possess the basic tools to carry out the terms of a probationary order. Jail is likely an impediment to their developing sense of responsibilities to themselves, to others, and to the community at large. If you three would just stand for a moment, Given the entirety of the circumstances, I'm treating each of the defendants in the same manner and impose a period of probation. The, the terms that I'm going to impose will be a blend between the pre-sentence report and the family conference recommendations. The terms are these. Keep the peace, be of good behavior, report forthwith to your youth court worker thereafter as directed, reside as directed, and abide by all the rules and regulations of that residence. You're not to change that residence without the prior approval of your youth court worker. You are each to abstain absolutely from the possession or consumption of alcohol and non-prescription drugs. 
as well. You're to supply a sample of your breath, blood, or urine for confirmation of this provision. Take and successfully complete counseling as directed. You're prohibited from possessing any weapons as defined by the criminal code. Attend school or be employed full-time as directed by your youth court worker. You're each to pay $150 to McKee on or before December 24, 2003 towards the costs of an electronic learning aid. As well, pursuant to your agreement reached at the family conference, you're each to perform 50 hours of community work service to be completed on or before June 30, 2003. And that uh, community hours are to be for the purposes of the preparation of a video and presentation to schools on the adverse effects of alcohol and violence. It's also appropriate in the uh, circumstances pursuant to the provisions of section 487.05 sub 1 that each of you provide a sample of your DNA. So, I'm just very thankful that this process was there to help my son face the people who had hurt him, help him understand what had happened, help him understand that his use of alcohol at night, things might have been different if even he were sober and, he, and they weren't. I thought that the process was interesting. I, I would definitely do it again. I, uh, I think it's also important that that sufficient amount of time be allowed to have a meaningful process occur, uh, should it fit in before actual sentencing itself occurs. Can it become a term of a probation? Perhaps the best route was as we had done in this occasion, and that is before formal sentencing had occurred. Uh, and probably also for a couple of other reasons, uh, if, if the sentencing, there's, there's a definite shift in how sentencing is to be approached uh, for young offenders. And, and the whole aspect of rehabilitation becomes a very, very powerful message. Uh, even in serious crimes such as this, uh, it depends, of course, on the young offender. But it, it, it doesn't stop there, obviously. It, it includes the uh, victim as well. And it's probably a new experience for everyone to um, shift that focus and make sure that the victim becomes part of the um, uh, rehabilitative package. It's almost like a gift, a bad way to get that yeah, gift, yeah. but in a way I'm kind of glad this happened to my son because I think he's learned a huge lesson in, in life at a young age and I believe, you know, all the, all, all the boys have. Uh, but I think it all put our souls at rest to a great degree and uh, I, I think this kind of process is going to be used a lot more in our judicial system as time goes on and especially with young offenders.